Modern Love, the podcast, is supported by... Produced by the iLab at WBUR Boston. From the New York Times and WBUR Boston, this is Modern Love. Stories of love, loss, and redemption. I'm your host, Meghna Chakrabarty. I'm always living in fear around losing another part of myself. In that moment, I felt like someone was there, like someone understood what I'd gone through. The psychic told her that her purpose in this life was love. I sat down and I cried. Welcome to the 100th episode of Modern Love, the podcast. To celebrate, we wanted to hear from you. A few months ago, we asked you to send in voice recordings about moments from past episodes that moved you, and we were blown away by your stories. Starting with Sandra, here's what she sent in. Every time I listen, I think I'm going to be moved by a story about loneliness or about romance or something like that. But I was completely unprepared for the Modern Love episode that broke me down. Sandra's talking about Brooke Reinhardt's essay, Sharing the Shame After My Arrest. In that piece, Brooke's new marriage is shattered when she and her husband are both arrested for crimes that he committed. Anna Klumsky read that piece for us. She's from HBO's Veep and the AMC show Halt and Catch Fire. Here's a bit of the essay. The federal charges were held against me for 90 days. That might not sound like a long time when discussing, say, party plans. But when facing criminal charges, losing your home and leaving the man you loved, or thought you loved, because after all, who was he really? Without so much as a word of goodbye... When that's your life, 90 days is an eternity. I decided to sleep on the couch at my parents' house. I was unable to go into my bedroom, where I had played with dolls, learned to paint my nails, and held slumber parties. It seemed like a sign of true regression and failure to sleep in my childhood bed at 28. So I slept on the couch. Introducing Magic Jack, the breakthrough device that makes your monthly phone bills disappear. The couch was perpendicular to the TV, so I could lie down and watch mindless programming all night. It was parallel to the matching love seat, a furniture set covered in stiff, green, outdated fabric. I slept on that couch for 90 nights, the full period I faced federal charges. And for those 90 nights, my mother slept on the love seat, her limbs hanging off at odd angles. I didn't ask her to sleep there. She just did. We have so many beds in this house, my father said. Why isn't anyone using them? Because Brooke can't, my mother answered. Brooke's description of a perfect exterior hiding something underneath resonated deeply with Sandra. She says she struggled after leaving an abusive marriage. On the outside, we were like this perfect couple. We were part of a Christian community. And so when I came out with the story of abuse and finally leaving him, it was so shameful for me. Um, And the way that my community received me was so harsh and unsupportive that I just fell into this deep shame. And so her talking about sleeping on the couch and at her parents' house and just being completely undone, I was walking to work listening to this and I was sobbing. Um, I'm a teacher and I was like, how am I going to go in and face my students like this? Because I could so relate. And I'm really glad for Brooke that she had her mom. I didn't have anyone. I was alone in that house um, lying on the couch. And in that moment, I felt like someone was there, like someone understood what I'd gone through because... This woman had such a similar experience to me. And so thank you, Brooke, for writing your, um, your experience that way because I related to it. Thanks. My name is Marlo Kalb. I'm 23. I was just recently listening to the podcast In Darkness and In Light. I'm, I have MS and I was diagnosed when I was 13. 
Um, and I, as a result of my MS, I have optic neuritis, which means that one day I woke up blind in one eye, and after some treatment, I only recovered partial sight in that eye, so I'm partially blind. I'm always living in fear around losing another part of myself, whether that be vision in the other eye or strength in certain parts of my body. Um, and I think it really affects my relationships. Um, I'm constantly uh, worried about becoming a burden on others, worried about whether they can become dependent on me. And I'm really grateful for Nicole's story. I think she really has an honest conversation about dependency when someone is struggling with a chronic disease. In the story, Nicole Carr writes about slowly going blind and the impact her blindness has on her marriage. Patina Miller, who stars in Madam Secretary, reads her piece. We pick up the story when Nicole and her husband David are going out to dinner for her 33rd birthday. On the walk to the restaurant, we reopened the debate about whether or not to have a third child. I wanted to, but was terrified I wouldn't be able to take care of the baby with my failing vision. David told me he would follow my lead, but he didn't see how we would possibly make it work. Our resources, money, time, and yes, vision, were already so limited. Halfway to the restaurant, our discussion developed into an argument, which ended with David storming off and telling me to go to the party without him. I stopped in my tracks, crumpled onto the nearest stoop, and I sobbed. I wasn't helpless. I could find my way home. But I couldn't go to the party without him. I couldn't see well enough to find my friends or read the menu. I needed David, and he resented it, and I resented his resentment. I remembered how I had told him I would go blind with a bang and not a whimper, and how he had promised we would always be together in darkness and in light. Seemed like we'd both been wrong. Some minutes later, David's big brown boots, the ones I always tripped over when he left them by the door, stepped into frame. You can't just leave me, I said. I need you. I know, he said. I hate it. So do I. Then he took my hand and said we'd figure it out. She says, yes, I am dependent on my husband, but he is also dependent on me. The way that we are dependent on each other is different, but it is reciprocal and it can be reciprocal. I think that's something that I need to remind myself in order to not constantly fear uh, becoming too dependent on others and just becoming comfortable with my loved ones being dependent on me. Another listener, Bonnie Viegas, brought us back to the second episode of Modern Love. It featured Dan Barry's essay about a dying father and a dying fish. Seinfeld's Jason Alexander read it for us. I look now at the food pellets gathered around the fish, my face nearly pressed against the glass of the bowl. Eat, I say sharply. My wife calls from the kitchen. Is everything all right up there? Everything's fine, I call back, not wanting to get into it, and then back to the fish. You stupid fish, I hiss. Eat. It was the same with my father last year at the veteran's home. At his bedside, measuring the inhalations, hoping against the evidence that he would rouse and ask for a roast beef sandwich on rye with brown mustard, a piece of Endemann's cake, a good cup of coffee, a glass of water... Just water would have delighted me. His appetite was considerable, once. On Thanksgiving, my father would delight in the tray of olives and celery presented by my mother. He had a deliberate way of sprinkling salt on the stalk, then onto the turkey and stuffing and candied yams and potatoes and string beans and pie and more pie. A sip of water, Dad. Just a sip. Bonnie says the essay might have been Dan Barry's story, but it was also her own. This episode came at a time when I had just lost my mother-in-law, who also refused to 
eat or drink, we would plead with her. Just one little bite, just one little sip. While I was listening to this episode, I began to feel overwhelmed. I began crying quietly for the fish and for the memory of my mother-in-law. I was amazed how the story was so familiar to mine. But I was going to be okay, and I was not alone. There were other people who had gone through this, and I was listening to proof. The irony of the story is that before my mother-in-law passed away, she gave us a fish. I smile every time I feed the fish, and he eats and he does a little dance. I think of my mother-in-law, and I know she's in a better place. My name is Jacqueline Guevas from Detroit, Michigan. Jacqueline wanted to share with us what it was like listening to Marcia DeSanctis' essay, What the Psychic Knew. Here's Angela Bassett reading from Marcia's piece. Years ago, panicked, on the cusp of 30, between jobs and wondering where life would take me, I consulted a psychic. I remember staring at the sea of green carpet in her home as she addressed the usual concerns. She told me to marry Mark, the man I was living with, that I would have a son and a daughter, and that my future with them would not be in New York City, contrary to what I had long assumed. Finally, I asked the question I really wanted answered. When will I die? That's not what I do, she said, so I can't say. You can't because you don't know or because it's bad. She tilted her head to one side. Can you tell me how, then? I see a severe blow to the head, she said, catching me squarely in the eyes. It will be sudden, and you won't feel pain. That's a relief, I said. I was born with a death sentence, like every creature that walks the earth, but I instantly regretted having this expertise into how I would leave it. But here's what I can say about this life, she continued, referring presumably to the time before I would be killed by a foul ball at Fenway Park or a tree branch in the woods. Your purpose is love. As opposed to what? She shrugged. Power, money, great acclaim. Mm. Too bad, I said. Jacqueline heard this story when she was at home, cleaning her daughter's bedroom. The psychic told her that her purpose in this life was love. I sat down and I cried. As a stay-at-home mom, I've given up my career to tend to three children and my husband. And that day, particularly, I was feeling lost. I was feeling angry. I was feeling quite honestly resentful that I had to wash clothes and cook and clean. And there was no time for me. I was losing myself. And when she said that her purpose in life was love, got me thinking, is, is, is that enough? Here I am thinking that my purpose should be more. I should discover something, invent something, change the world. But the love I give to my children and my family could change the world. And it really changed me. It changed my perspective on the job of what, what motherhood is, what impact your love and patience could have on the world. That moment, of all the stories I've listened to, That moved me. We'll be back with more of your stories for this special 100th episode of Modern Love, the podcast. Stay with us. We're back. It's Modern Love, the podcast. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty. 
Let's hear now from Justin. He loved Gary Presley's episode, A Heart Outrun. It's about a man confined to a wheelchair who falls for his caretaker, Belinda. It's read by Colin Farrell. I believed I did not deserve to love Belinda. I believed I should not allow her to love me. I held hard to the idea I should be content to ride out the remainder of my life without complaint. A burned out case, an absurd hodgepodge of broken parts, a beggar who no longer wished for a horse. But she was also a woman, beautiful and vibrant, and I was a man, in a wheelchair, true, but a man full of heat and desire that sometimes rendered the chair irrelevant. And I was the keeper of an obscene little secret I had known perhaps since I had been stuck in the iron lung and surely from some vague moment later at the point where I realised I would never walk again. It is a thing that will sit rancid in my gut until the day I die, a thing that until then had eaten away at any illusion that love and marriage for me would be like it was in books or movies. And it was this. I would be physically dependent upon those who might love me. I am a chore, an obligation, and I will ever be so. I could not rationalise how a woman might love me and not soon come to hate the millstone I believed myself to be. All this ricocheted through my mind, not in words but in a fog of melancholic unease as I stared at Belinda. Suddenly she moved from the couch and across the few steps between us. I opened my arms and she dropped into my lap and put her head on my shoulder. There was no sound, no words between us, only her tears and my silent wonder. Justin says that when he heard this story, he really connected with Gary's cynicism. And I just fell so deeply in love with the story because it was at a point in time when I felt that I could relate to the main character, this man's philosophy that his heart is something undeserving and unobtainable of love, and he takes a leap of faith and chances it with her. My name is Kiran, and I'm from Virginia. Kiran sent us a voice memo about Lily King's essay, An Empty Heart is One That Can Be Filled. I found myself listening to this podcast in a loop, like it was some sad song that was on repeat mode. In the piece, Lily, at 31, experiences heartbreak for the first time when her boyfriend breaks up with her in the parking lot of a gas station. Here's actress and director Zoe Lister-Jones reading from Lily's piece. It was over. There were chrysanthemums planted along one edge of the parking lot, and every time I drove past those flowers that fall, I would sob and wail in my car. I ran on the paths along the Charles River and I thought, this is what happens to people. This is what people and books and movies are talking about when they talk about losing love. People's hearts break and it feels like this. It, it feels like someone has beaten you up with brass knuckles. But it also felt at the same time like The universe was welcoming me in. I was heartbroken, but I felt less alone than I had in a long while. Kiran says that Lily's essay reminded her that there can be a silver lining to heartbreak. Something that caught my attention, and I think I'm struggling with that right now, is how a person ends up being a ghost in your mind, living in your mind as a ghost until that one day when everything comes out and you learn to let it go. I'm in that stage right now and I still find myself going back and listening to this episode uh, and I can't wait to find my silver lining Ben Sellers related to Caroline Levitt's essay, My Touchstone and a Heart of Gold. It's about her bond with her pet, Minnie. And it was read by Ruth Nega from AMC's Preacher. 
I was sitting alone watching an old movie on TV, the tortoise on my lap, a book on the table for later. As I stroked Minnie's leathery head, I began to realise how calm and happy I was. I had a more fulfilling relationship with the tortoise than I did with the boyfriend. Minnie and I let each other be who we were. I've never seen my dad more sad than the day that he called me to tell me that his dog, Freckles, had died. Um, He had lost friends and loved ones in the past and had always done it with a remarkable amount of stoicism and he's very uh, even keel and in control of his emotions. Um, He had a nasty divorce. My mom had left him. He had never shown almost any, you know, vulnerability, but when his dog died, he he really broke down and, and it was a pretty touching moment. It was pretty remarkable. And I think what this essay shows is that in some cases, people can actually learn about love in a deeper sense from their pets. And in the case of my father, what he learned from his dog was that uh, in the midst of multiple transcontinental moves and a nasty divorce, that he was worth sticking around for. For Shara Myers, one episode had a lasting impact. In 2015, I found out that I was unexpectedly, but very happily, pregnant with a boy. My husband and I take the naming of our children pretty seriously, maybe a little too seriously. I knew it would be a struggle for us to find a name that resonated with both of us and also reflected our hopes for the man our son will one day become. We found and agreed upon a first name kind of easily, but I wanted a middle name to reflect the emotional well-being and development of a nice, sweet boy, for lack of better words. I was listening to your podcast and I heard Natalie Lindemann's essay, The Upside of an Emotional Plunge, and was immediately in love. Dakota Fanning reads Natalie's story. It's about a hike that Natalie took with her new boyfriend, Wilder. And on that hike, Natalie fell 100 feet from a canyon wall. Somehow, she survived. Sometimes I think my body saved itself that day by learning to surrender. That those years of falling prepared me to relax into the 100-foot plunge. But it was weeks after the fall before I could truly let go. I thought I could use my injuries as an excuse to push Wilder away. I thought I could keep things casual. I thought I could forget the look on his face as I fell and ignore the terrifying feeling of longing in my chest. But I couldn't. Maybe it was the way he said, I'd rather spend my summer with you than any other girl. Maybe it was how being around him made me forget the brace and the wounds, made me feel whole and unbroken. Finally, surrender became not just inevitable, but exhilarating. I didn't want to hold on to anything anymore. I wanted to fall, and I already had. And I knew that this time, too, I would be okay. Shara says that after she heard the episode, she went back and read the original essay, and then sent both the podcast episode and the column to her family. And in that story, they found what they were looking for. And so it was decided. Our son, Marcellus Wilder, was born on April 4th, 2016. And so far, he is every bit as sweet as he is strong. We've got more after the break. For Tracy Hoyt, it was Diane Daniels' essay that really got to her. It's called My Husband is Now My Wife, and it's about Diane's experience of watching her spouse go through a gender transition. It was read by Anne Dowd of The Handmaid's Tale. This line is the one that that really rattled me to the point where I had to listen to this essay several more times. I started to cry, softly, politely, but I really wanted to wail and sob. How do you grieve for someone you've lost, but who is still there? I was so profoundly moved by the way Anne Dowd was moved by those beautiful words and that really, really hard question. And that question made me 
think about love and grief in so many new ways. And I will always be grateful for that. Katie Chavez connected with Victor Lodato's essay, When Your Greatest Romance is a Friendship. Victor writes about how, to his surprise, his elderly neighbor Austin became his best friend. There was a line where Austin said to him, Living alone can make you funny. And this resonated with me, and I use it almost uh, in my everyday life. When um, I am home, alone, I've recently gone through a breakup, and I live alone for the first time. And when I am feeling funny, I remember this line in this podcast, and and it just makes me feel 100% better. Amy Seek's essay, Open Adoption, Not So Simple Math, hit home for listener Medalise. My mother did not give me up for adoption permanently, but she left me in the care of her parents for five years when she moved to the States uh, as an undocumented worker. When she finally returned and I met her for the first time, all I wanted to do was to spend time with her. I am now 27 and have been able to talk to my mom about how she coped with the decision to leave me behind. Her sentiment was captured by Amy's words. I realized that his adoption had been both my greatest accomplishment and deepest regret. Without her sacrifice to come to the States, we would have continued to struggle in Peru. Of course, I would have loved to have her by my side when I learned my first words or read my first book. But I have to remember she did the best she could, just like Amy. Hannah sent us this from Knoxville, Tennessee. It's about an essay written by another Hannah, Hannah Selinger, and her story about two friends who circle around each other for years without ever really defining their relationship. I was in this awful, volatile friendship, pseudo-relationship thing that really went on for essentially four years. I think the hundred some time that I I listened to that episode, I finally had the courage to walk away from the thing I was killing myself over. And he did. And all is well now. Isabella Sperduto loved Carlos Kotkin's essay, We Didn't Have a Plan, But the Baby Did. She heard it when she was pregnant for the first time, and she worried about how a new baby would change her life. After the episode, he is sharing a story about how he and his daughter are drove past uh, the house where he used to live before he had met his wife or or had his daughter. And I pointed it out to her. I said I used to used to live there, and she asked me who did I live with, and I said I lived by myself, which was shocking to her. By yourself? She wanted to know where she was and where mommy was, and I told her that I had not met either of them yet. And she responded, I bet you missed us. Very much. I missed them very much. I told her that. And something about this stopped me in my tracks. I'm not sure if it was the hormones or if it was just a really well-told story. But I started to cry and I started to really think about how we have the capacity to love people we haven't even yet met and how... You know, our hearts really expand to care deeply about people who aren't even yet in our lives. And that gave me a lot of peace and a lot of hope, and it really meant a lot. So I wanted to say thank you. Well, actually, we want to thank you, to everyone who sent us their voice memos and everyone who listens to the podcast. Modern Love really works because of you. You're on the other end, listening, thinking, and relating to these remarkable stories. Dan Jones, editor of Modern Love for the New York Times, knows all of these stories very well. But he says the podcast has made him hear them differently. So at this point, I've been editing Modern Love for for 14 years, and... I don't know how many essays that is, 700 or so. And it's always been a thing that's just been flat on the page. And when we first talked about having a podcast, I thought, well, who wants to hear someone read an essay to them? And so I wasn't all that optimistic about the whole project at the start. And um, I was so won over right off the bat by what a skilled actor can bring 
to a reading. And of course, it's the same thing they do in television and the movies. They, they inhabit this character and sort of fill up these flat words on the page with, with, with a context and a depth and a, and a sort of breadth of experience. It's just kind of a magic that they pull off. Um, and I, I sort of feel as grateful you know, that I was able to, to have a story that was already known to me and that I didn't think could surprise me because the story itself can't surprise me and still be engaged to that degree. It's really what, what has made me love this experience more than anything else. Well, let's give the last word today to the producers of Modern Love, the podcast, Jessica Alpert, John Parati, Amory Sievertson, and Caitlin O'Keefe. Here's Jessica. I think it's really amazing to hear what people say when they listen. I mean, when we make this podcast, we put it out. We don't really know how it trickles out into the world. So um, to hear from listeners is just it's an incredible feeling. It's it's so much work and so much love that we put into every minute. Um, and to know that it, you know, people are connecting with it is, is powerful. Okay, though. So then, what's one? What's one that gets to you? Most recently, I will say uh, there was a moment recording with Ann Dowd. She got really emotional during that recording, and what she said to us is just reading this out loud. I'm I'm feeling every word of this. I feel like I'm really living her story, and you're kind of reminded over and over again how real these stories are and and how much they mean to the people who wrote them, the people who are reading them, and hopefully the people who are listening to them. I really love Many Drivers. Our story ended with a slow fade to black. Uh, Exactly, by Patty Dan. And it is just so beautiful. Um, And I know that every minute was scrutinized in that (laughs) one. (laughs) What are you getting at? (laughs) What happened in that one? Yes, John. What happened in that one? <laughs> oh, let me think. I uh, I uh, poured my heart out into that mix, <laughs> as you do. And at the very end, there's this moment where she she's with her son. They're standing over a grave, and she <laughs> sees this train in the distance. Okay, <laughs> that train whistle that you hear in there is not the one I originally put in because Am- because the one Am- you originally put in. Because no, listen though, because we did the whole episode. I sent it out to everybody. I was like, "Hey guys, the mix is finished. Like, yeah. check it out." And Amory says, "I have one problem." <laughs> did I say it like that? Yeah. And I was like, "Okay," and she's like, "That train whistle is all wrong." <laughs> and we spent thirty minutes. Watching train videos, <laughs> yep. trying to figure out what train whistles sounded just right. And so that one in there is that the only time we ever, I almost wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> to high five me for my, my brilliant train whistle selection. The funny thing is that hopefully most people just don't heard even, that. And well, that's the thing. They, like, most people don't. <laughs> have no idea that there was like. Uh, you know, a tense half an hour poured into making sure that we had the right train whistle that 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 didn't take away from what else was happening in that moment. Well, and that's the thing, right? It's like most of this stuff, it's a lot of hard work, but you don't really, if you if you don't really notice it, then we're doing our job. Mm-hmm. We got to put Caitlin on the spot here. Caitlin, do you have a favorite moment or episode or thing that you love about working on this? I love the openness of the authors on this podcast that you call these people who have who are writers most of the time who write these stories and send them in to modern love and then Dan Jones goes through them and edits them there are a couple of degrees of protection in that i think and and then we call these authors and we ask them really personal questions about powerful sometimes scary moments in their lives and they don't have those layers of protection anymore. It's a scary thing. And yet these people are still so open with themselves anyway, and they share so much of themselves. And those are my favorite moments, are the moments where you can hear somebody sort of sharing of themselves in a way that lets you connect with them. And there are a lot of those moments. Like, I'm sure you have a million of those. Well, that's so funny because I'm just thinking of how we, (laughs) like in the early (laughs) days, we would sit there and you know, I would always go there. You know, I just felt like it was my job to ask that question. Yes. That everyone was like, "So did you like?" You the... just cannot stop Jess from going there. You know, yes. like there was this essay about um, uh, a Mormon woman who Nicole Hardy, who was uh, trying to lose her virginity, or and I had to ask her, like, "Did you ever lose your virginity?" And John is in a corner, like, "Oh my god." 
Yeah. Did you really have to ask her that? And I was like, yes, you know what everyone who's listening is wondering. So we had this great little thing going on where John would just like hit his head on the wall. (laughs) You know, all of us have been doing this work for quite some time now. And this is like the project of a lifetime. I just hope that whatever I do next... (laughs) I'm already doing cool stuff, by the way. You should subscribe <laughs> on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcast. <laughs> but um, uh, it's just been a really great ride, and and um, it's not over. No. We get to hopefully make 100 more of these things. There are uh, 700 essays out there. There are more than 700. Buckle <laughs> <laughs> your seat, though. <laughs> Thanks again for listening to this special episode of Modern Love. I can't believe we've already heard 100 stories together. Here's looking forward to hundreds more. Modern Love is a production of The New York Times and WBUR, Boston's NPR station. It's produced, directed, and edited by Jessica Alpert, John Parati, Emery Sievertson, and Caitlin O'Keefe. Our sound designers are Matt Reed and Paul Vikas. The idea for the Modern Love podcast was conceived by Lisa Tobin. Iris Adler is our executive producer. Daniel Jones is the editor of Modern Love for the New York Times and advisor to the show. Music for the podcast, courtesy of APM. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty. See you next week. Hold up. 